Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that has been around for three years. The first episode of Close Horse was released so long ago on July 12th, 2020, which does feel like a million years ago in terms of all the things I have learned over the past few years, all the things we have experienced collectively over the past few years, and just like, wow, life a lot of life has happened in three years. And I'm really proud to say that a lot of podcasts appeared in 2020 and 2021, and a lot of them are gone now. But Close Horse is still going strong, and it feels like it has picked up so much momentum this year alone. So I'm excited to see what will happen next. Anyway, I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 168. I'm really excited for you to meet today's guest because she's going to teach us more about EPR, also known as Extended Producer Responsibility. Joanne is the Special Projects Manager for the California Product Stewardship Council, known as CPSC. Her background is in textile science and the Global Industrial Systems for Food and Fibers, NBD, right? She has won various awards over the years for her research into these topics. And she was also the sustainability researcher for the UC Davis Health System, leading projects for waste mitigation and more sort of like environmentally friendly purchasing options for the campus. And when you think about more environmentally friendly purchasing options for a huge medical campus, we're talking about really significant buys, like large quantities that can have a major impact on the waste stream. Her efforts with the UCD health system led to systematic reduction of textile products in the hospital waste stream and cost savings for the entire health system. Today, she's going to help us understand how EPR works and how it will impact business, planet, communities, and us as consumers. She will also tell us about all of the projects and stakeholders involved in CPSC's projects and legislation goals, and she will tell us how we can practice our own textile stewardship. But before we get into that, I wanted to take a few moments to reflect on three years of Close Horse. Three years ago today, I was living in Philadelphia. I had just lost my job working in the buying department of a rental brand after months of being on furlough. And in some ways, losing my job felt like a massive relief. I had spent the last few weeks of my employment before being furloughed canceling every single order in our system as directed by our executive leadership. This meant canceling orders that had already been produced Some of them were already in the United States, others were on a boat or a plane, and many were at the port overseas just waiting to ship. Many others had already been cut or partially made. At the very least, all of the trims and fabric were ready to go. That entire process was sickening. Sales reps were crying. Many lost their jobs the same week we canceled our orders. Vendors pleaded for another solution because this would destroy their businesses. Small brands and designers were very nearly or completely ruined financially. I talked with a friend late recently who is helping one of those designers with her website uh, now in 2023. And she told her that basically our specific cancellation almost ran her out of business back in 2020. And Living through that, experiencing that, it felt wrong even at the time because the company I worked for always bragged about how we didn't have to worry about our business, how our business was better than any other business out there because we always had $100 million in the bank on top of all of the other assets the company had. And to cancel these orders and see people lose their livelihoods, lose their sense of security, lose their sense of what would come next. It felt it felt so wrong. That experience underscored the cruelty of prioritizing profits over people. And this approach, to be fair, is not unique 
to that rental brand or the fast fashion company that owns it. It is the way the entire retail and fashion industry has been doing business for a very long time. I could follow that thread, that thread of cruelty, of money over everything else, all the way back to the retail jobs that I had worked as a teenager and a young adult. The low wages, the lack of consistent scheduling, the shitty but also so hard to get benefits of health care and paid time off. The way we would all be kept, in fact, just under regular full-time hours so we couldn't get benefits. The policies that reminded us every day that the company believed we were all criminals first and bodies to do a job second. Our humanity wasn't even up for discussion. Further reading and research during my furlough revealed so much more of the cruel and human nature of the fashion industry, the exploitation of all of the humans involved in making our clothing and its individual elements, the pollution and waste, the fundamental disregard for people and planet. So in some ways, being laid off was a relief. How could I ever return to that job and pretend that everything was okay? But it was also super scary because there would be no jobs for me on the horizon. When you've reached the leadership level of your career, which is where I have been for quite some time now, there are a lot less jobs out there and they open up less frequently. My employer gave me two weeks of severance, which was kind of nothing after more than 10 years of combined service for that company, for like the parent company. They cut off my health insurance a week later in the midst of a global pandemic. These stingy decisions were explained to me by my boss as the result of the unprecedented nature of the pandemic and the damage it was doing to the company. In fact, in that phone call, yes, I was let go over the phone. And to be fair, my now former boss did thank me for my maturity in the way in which I handled it all, which was just kind of like, okay, I mean, what was I going to do, right? I knew that this was the end of something for me and it was really scary, but she also painted it to me that the company might go under because of all of this, that basically some of us had to be sacrificed for the company to live another day, for so many other people to keep their jobs. Okay, I could accept that even if I didn't like it, even if it scared the shit out of me. A week later, I was bombarded with articles from friends, from the internet, all over, coming in all directions, declaring my former employer's surprise profit for that quarter. And it was surprising in a year in which all businesses were losing money thanks to these unprecedented times of a pandemic, right? That profit that this company miraculously made was comprised entirely of lost wages, the wages of store employees who had been furloughed for months, of garment workers who went unpaid for the work they had already done when orders were canceled, and corporate workers like myself who had been furloughed and laid off. I was enraged, but things also felt dark and hopeless. During my furlough, I had been thinking a lot about the fashion industry, how glamorous people thought it was, how self-important all of the media coverage of all caps fashion was, the way a love of clothing and shopping was seen as a whole persona, a character trope. Isn't that basically what Sex and the City is all about? (laughs) I laughed thinking about all the times over the years when I told someone what I did for a living, how they immediately assumed I was both glamorous and fabulous. But really, I had spent years being super stressed out, eating overpriced salads, and hunching over a spreadsheet. What if people knew the things that I knew about the industry? Would this change their feelings toward clothing and shopping? I started Clothes Horse as an experiment. Would people be interested in hearing about all of the dark shit my coworkers and I had been compartmentalizing for years? 
Or would it be too boring, too depressing? Would it ruin the implied fun of clothes and shopping? I was afraid of failure, but I also felt, honestly, as if I had nothing to lose. The thing was, I knew nothing about making a podcast. So the first thing I learned was that making a good podcast is a lot more work than you might imagine, or at least more work than I imagined. There's a lot of research, writing, outreach, strategy, and lots of tiny, annoying tasks like making a website, writing show notes, and dealing with all of the various apps and platforms required to make a podcast accessible to as many people as possible. It is like so many little tiny annoying things you have to do to put out one episode of a podcast. Dustin gave me a crash course in editing, production, sound, and he still does all of the final audio production, and I am very grateful. I have made some major sound quality bloopers over the years, and he always figures out how to fix it. You don't even know how lucky I am. Next, I learned Figma, Photoshop, and lots of other graphic design stuff because it turned out that a lot of people wanted the information I was sharing, but they wanted it on social media. I never thought in 2020 that I would spend as much time thinking about and making content for Instagram as I do. It's very weird. I am a content creator, it turns out. (laughs) Here's the thing about all of the infographics. Oh my God, they are so much more work than any observer might imagine. The average Instagram post takes about three hours to create, sometimes less if I already have copy or art ready to go. It's all about, you know, finding the perfect balance of info and readability, accessibility, and of course, aesthetic on every single slide. It's a visual and intellectual logic problem. I do kind of love it. (laughs) But beyond graphic design and audio editing, two skill sets I didn't think I'd be taking on a few years ago, I've learned so much over the years. Some of it is straight up statistics and how the global supply chain works. Certainly, I've learned way too much about, say, how synthetic fabrics are made that no one will probably ever invite me to a party again because I will bore everyone. (laughs) I mean, I've learned to always use the Instagram features that allow you to keep trolls out of your life. In fact... I've learned way too much about trolls and their pattern of escalation. I've learned to not be butthurt every time Remake doesn't include me in their roundup of best sustainability podcasts. Okay, I'm still butthurt about that, but I'm trying not to be. Um, I've learned to get it all in writing because I've had some bad partnerships that taught me some very difficult lessons, especially last year. There were tears, there was frustration, there were long strings of curse words. But beyond all of that, I've learned so many other things that have helped me grow as a leader in this community, as a person who has the unique opportunity and privilege of a platform that reaches others. These are things that have changed me as a person And they've helped me grow and connect better with people around me, even in like the world outside of Clothes Horse. It's really helped me figure out a lot about connecting with others. One of the first things I've learned is that talking about fast fashion isn't classist if you're doing it right. In the first year or so of Close Horse, every time I posted anything about the fast fashion business model, which as you may have guessed was quite often, like clockwork, someone would show up in the comment section to call me classist. And it would kind of flummox me because I didn't know how to respond to these people. And honestly, I also kind of knew that no response would ever fix that situation. What I realized over time is that these conversations are tough. They're shocking. They're downright depressing. All of us handle tough information in different ways. Abject panic, depression, ignoring it, or anger. So yeah, for every message I've received over the years asking for more information or thanking me for sharing information, I've received angry ones that accuse me of being classist or an out-of-touch privileged white lady. And by the way, 
I'm non-binary, so please stop sending me messages calling me a lady because it is very hurtful. I also know that when I receive messages like that, that this is a person who was so just emotionally impacted by whatever that post was that they couldn't even like take the time to see what I'm all about, to look at other posts, to look at my profile, to listen to the podcast. For those of you who are new around here, you know, I grew up low income and I have been called white trash and trailer trash more often than I've been called anything nice. I've been on food stamps, on government assistance. I wouldn't have been able to receive medical care when I gave birth to my daughter without Medicaid coverage. And I know way too well what it's like to not be able to see a doctor or a dentist because you don't have the money. I don't own a home and the car I share with my husband is 20 years old, right? And so when people would reach out and accuse me of being classist, it hurt. It confused me. I didn't know where to go next. But what I realized, and I guess I already knew this, it's my background and my own financial situation that makes me super passionate about this work because it's the poorest people on this planet who bear the brunt of fast fashion's disastrous business model. By virtue of being born in Pennsylvania, my family does not work in garment factories, but most have been working in the retail industry in stores or in warehouses or by driving trucks, and these jobs kept and keep them struggling. All of us, no matter where we live or what we do for our living, are experiencing the repercussions of fast fashion. Microplastics in the water and soil and food supply, water scarcity, the impact of carbon emissions, and even the emotionally corrosive nature of a steady stream of low quality and poor fitting clothing. It's not classist to talk about fast fashion, and it's time for all of us to talk about it with as many people as possible because fast fashion actually exacerbates economic inequality. It sets the precedent for underpaying people. It keeps people poor, and it keeps customers on a hamster wheel of shopping that strips them of their own financial health. And oh my God, if I could just build a time machine, well, there are probably other things I would do first, but one thing on the list would be to go back to 2020 and 2021 and lay this knowledge on people. (laughs) Seriously. I mean, like I said, there are other things I'd probably do with the time machine first, but this would be on the list somewhere. (laughs) Okay, The next thing that I've learned is that shame and guilt are not the way forward in conversations about consumption, fast fashion, shopping, all the things. I have seen a major shift in the way we have conversations about fast fashion and shopping over the last few years, and I am delighted about that. In 2020 and 2021, so much social media content around these topics was really shame-focused, that people should feel bad for making the wrong decisions or not knowing why they were wrong in the first place. These conversations always lacked the necessary nuance that explained why so-called sustainable brands weren't accessible to many, many people due to barriers of price, size inclusivity, availability, and aesthetic. In fact, that brings me to the next thing I have learned, which is meet people where they are. Skipping fast fashion is hard. We've grown up in a culture of shopping that makes it really, really hard to change. You know, before I continue with this, Let's listen to a message from Erin, the librarian, a recurring voice around here, although she hasn't called in for a while, so it was super nice to hear from her. Let's listen to this message from Erin because it's really part of this conversation about meeting people where they are. Hey, 
Hey, Amanda. First, I wanted to say congratulations on three years of Close Horse. Uh, seeing that it was your three-year anniversary today on social media reminded me of when you had the hotline that first year of Close Horse, and I called in a few times to pose some questions to you. Uh, well, in honor of that, here's another unsolicited audio recording for you. Um, first, I'll preface this by saying that I still buy new clothes. Um, I'm definitely a lot more uh, thoughtful about it. For example, I bought a bathing suit recently. It's from a retailer that I bought from before, um, and you all might have seen them on Instagram. Um, but what I like about this brand compared to um, another one that's out there is that they kind of just stick to swimsuits. They haven't like ventured into clothing. Um, I was really happy with the swimsuit I bought from there um, a few years ago, and since I live near the beach, I wanted another swimsuit to add to my rotation. Um, and I bought one from them um, again this year. I'm really happy with it. Uh, more recently, I bought a new dress. Um, I was in Arizona last month visiting my parents with my young son and I pretty much only packed t-shirts and shorts because it's hotter than Hades there. My brother and sister-in-law last minute gifted me with uh, professional pictures of me, my son, and my parents. I should also add that this was the last time I was going to be photographed with my dad as he had terminal cancer, so that kind of added pressure in my mind to look nice. Um, I wanted something nice to wear, but I didn't really have the time or ability to go looking for a secondhand option. Um, I ended up buying a dress from this French clothing brand that was advertised to me on Instagram, but also seemed to have good reviews from some people whose opinion I trusted and could ship to me in time for the photo shoot. I was really impressed with the quality and the style of the dress means I can wear it not just to a nice event, but I could also get away with wearing it to work. Um, it's also really comfortable. Now, I'll be the first to say that these probably aren't the most ethical or sustainable brands out there, but they aren't the worst defenders either. And I'm um, I'm really happy with the items I bought, and I know I'll get a lot of use out of them. Um, with that said, the swimsuit brand has since tried to get me to join a rewards program. Um, but, like, how many bathing suits does one person need? Um, I live near the beach, and my parents have a pool, and I only have three swimsuits. And assuming I take care of them, um, I shouldn't be buying them constantly. Uh, who out there is needing a ton of swimsuits that could benefit from a rewards program? Um, as for the French brand, their advertising seems to have an air of, like, don't you want to be cool and French and leave, live this easygoing lifestyle? Um, I will say I've recently lost my dad to the cancer, um, and I also lost one of my cats soon after. Um, so I really found myself feeling the pull of this, like, aspirational advertising, and I was, like, perusing their website looking for, like, other stuff I could buy until I was, like wait a minute, I don't know what you're doing. Um, so all of this is to say that, like, um, do you think there's an ethical way to advertise to people and let them know that you exist without making them feel bad or making them feel anxious or like trying to get them to overconsume? Um, as I try to spread the gospel of slow fashion to people in my circle, there are people that are like, listen, I'm all about trying to be more sustainable, but I do not want to buy secondhand clothing. And rather than argue with them, I try to meet them halfway. Like, have you thought about trying to shop less? And that seems to be a better sell. Um, but then when someone does need to buy something new, um, how do they know what's out there? Um, how can they stay strong when brands feel like they need to use these tactics to sell to us? And if you're someone running a small sustainable business, like how do you compete? Um, I was able to make good decisions when I did buy those two new things. Um, but it's really hard. Even after being on this slow fashion journey for a few years, um, to just like not get sucked in. Um, and I'm curious what you think about all this. Um, congratulations again, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for you and for Close Source. First, I just wanna say, Aaron, I am so sorry for your losses. I know that mere words don't do very much when you're navigating grief. But know that I'm thinking of you. And I know so many other people are thinking of you as well. Next, guess what? The Clothes Horse Hotline does still exist. I just keep forgetting to remind people to call. <laughs> the phone number is 717-925-7417. And Google is actually threatening to disconnect the number if someone doesn't call me on it by the end of July. So maybe this is a great time to remind you that you can call and leave a message anytime. And I'll put that number in the show notes just in case you feel like it. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Aaron's quandary, which I bet a lot of you are facing yourselves. 
talking to people about consumption who maybe don't want to have the conversation in the first place, or at the very least, aren't as immersed in it as we are. This is where meeting people where they are really comes into play. Listen, shopping, new clothes, fast fashion, they are woven into our culture and social behavior at this point. And we've been swimming in it since birth. Think about it. We've been told our entire lives that new stuff equals happiness. We are exposed to advertising everywhere we look. Social media, streaming platforms, billboards, haul videos. Oh my God, Dustin and I were watching this Lifetime movie last night that is based on a V.C. Andrews book. And I swear that there was an ad every five minutes. No, not ad, singular, like five ads every five minutes to a point where I was like, I don't remember what's happening in the movie because there's been so many commercials. Ads are everywhere. There are even ads in stalls in public bathrooms right now. (laughs) I've seen a lot of those too. Social media has reinforced the idea that we need to wear something new for every event. And every time I bring that up on social media, 50% of people are like, literally, what are you talking about? And the other 50% are like, literally, thank you for calling that out, right? If you've been able to avoid the outfit of the day phenomenon over the last 10 years, I am so jealous because it is, I've just been bombarded with it. Furthermore, magazines and blogs reinforce the idea that new clothes, new makeup, all of that will fix our problems. That's basically the plot of a ton of movies I saw as a child and teenager, always including, you know, either a shopping montage and or a makeover montage. And when you get down to brass tacks, at least at face value, fast fashion is more affordable and often more size inclusive. We know it's far more complex than that, but the overall impression out there in the world of fast fashion is that it's cheap and it comes in more sizes. So why not buy it, right? This is the world we know. It's programmed deep into our brains. People literally cite shopping as a hobby. And for many, including myself at times, it's a social activity. But here's the thing. We have to move away from it, right? The future literally depends on it. Our planet and its people can no longer support the repercussions of overconsumption in the fast fashion era. And while clothing is a big part of it, this fast consumption extends to all categories of stuff. Home goods, furniture, appliances, pet clothing, (laughs) and other toys and products. I mean, it's just everywhere. The fast fashion model of buy as much stuff as possible as often as possible eats up resources like water and energy at an unsustainable rate. Nothing is disposable, yet this illusion of disposability has led to pollution consisting solely of unwanted clothing, although there are probably some pet clothes in there. There are definitely Halloween costumes in there. There are definitely some throw pillows from home goods in there, you know? The low prices of fast fashion and basically everything else are unachievable without exploitation of the humans making our stuff. These are the facts that we must all accept when we think about what's happening in this fast fashion era. So where do I start with people? Well, it's with information. Maybe not going super hard right out of the gate, like maybe we hold off on the photos from Accra or the Atacama Desert for the next conversation, or maybe that's the jump off. It's pretty shocking, that's for sure. If that's what will get someone to listen, go for it. But even sharing that kind of information tends to let us think that fast fashion and overconsumption are someone else's problem, that it's happening far, far away from here. But the reality is that even if you don't work in a factory or warehouse or store, fast fashion is having a negative impact on you, which I mentioned earlier. That's kind of where I'd like to start with people like, hey, this is affecting you and everyone you know. I like to remind them of these points that just about everything we buy brand new is not built to last. Planned obsolescence ensures that we will have to buy replacement in the near future. This shortened product life cycle means we end up spending more money over time and being kind of like less happy with what we have. Next, 
clothing costs less now than it did in the 1990s. Even though some guy on Reddit last week was trying to tell me otherwise, I was like, dude, here's the data. He did not respond. Anyway, (laughs) he was asking, how do we get clothes to be even cheaper? And I just, yeah. Anyway, other combo, right? (laughs) But anyway, this magical low price means that the fabric and trims don't have a lot of longevity. This also has an impact on our individual financial situation. The poor fit and arbitrary sizing of clothing has a negative impact on our mental health and our relationship with our bodies. And the last thing I always mention to people is, does any of this stuff really make us happy? No matter where you live on the planet, like I said, you are experiencing the environmental impact of the production and disposal of fast fashion and all of the other things we consume. You know, once again, it's the microplastics in the water and the soil and the food, it's climate change, it's air and water pollution. The reality is that sometimes it's just too hard for an individual to think about someone they don't know. But it's easy to think about yourself, right? And I think pointing out these truths can be beneficial but it doesn't lead with guilt. It's not you should feel bad about what's happening to these other people. It's this is hurting you. Where does it go next? I think it's important to remember that there is no one easy fix to a more sustainable lifestyle. For some of us, shopping secondhand is our first step. For others, it's skipping a big clearance sale, or maybe it's learning more about laundry and mending. The thing about all of this is that any of these moves can end up being step one in a journey into slow fashion. That's where community comes into play. When your Instagram feed is all Amazon and Target influencers, you aren't exposed to slow fashion, right? You're exposed to buying more stuff. Another reason to buy more stuff, this thing you need that will fix your life, that kind of thing. But when your friends and family are posting about mending this thing or what they found out thrifting last week, suddenly the wheels start turning. Suddenly there are other options. And then you follow new accounts, see more new ideas, find yourself going down this rabbit hole of slow fashion and buying less. It normalizes these ideas, these behaviors. You join your local buy nothing group. You find this whole new world of neighbors. It feels natural, it's fun. It's like you're part of something. Many of us, including myself, have lived this experience firsthand over the last few years. Now, we can be the friends and family that expose others to new ideas, right? We're kind of like, the aged pillars of this community that we've been growing within for all these years. And now we can bring more people into the fold and get them to opt out of, oh, I don't know, silly bathing suit rewards programs. (laughs) Which brings me to my last two important lessons learned over the past three years. One person cannot change the world alone, but when we work together, we can start social trends with major impact. Another common response to social media posts back in 2020, 2021, always happened like clockwork too. And it was, it's not the responsibility of individuals to change and my impact will never be as significant as Amazon, so why bother? These were comments that also, pardon my French, really fucked with me because I didn't know what to say. Or it's like, in my heart, I knew what to say, but I was afraid of turning it into a comment war. And I had so much imposter syndrome that I figured, what could I know that was worth hearing? What could I possibly say to this person who might be smarter than me? They might be the right one. It was like I couldn't believe in myself and what I knew and what I spent so much time thinking about and reading about. I just, I guess another thing I've learned over the past few years is to believe in me, right? Anyway, these comments would really mess with me because I wouldn't know what to say. But the fact of the matter, and I knew this way back then too, was that Amazon, for example, did not happen in a bubble. Amazon became what it is because everyone started buying tons of shit from them all the time. Walmart killed local businesses in small towns because people preferred the lower prices and convenience of Walmart. Fast fashion became what it is because people wanted a lot of cheap clothing. And I get why customers would shift into fast fashion or Amazon or Walmart, because 
Most of us don't have the privilege of time and money, right? But we also have to reconcile that with the repercussions of it, right? These systems don't set us up for success. These systems are flawed and exploitative. But Amazon, Walmart, fast fashion as a whole, they are examples of what happens when many individuals start doing the same thing at the same time. Maybe we didn't collectively decide, like we didn't have a big meeting where we all said, okay, here's the thing. Now we're only gonna buy things from Amazon or Fashion Nova or Forever 21 or whatever. But nonetheless, we all took the same action at the same time and the impact was huge. Amazon drove tons of other businesses out of business. Walmart did that well before Amazon. Fast fashion became the business model for just about every category of stuff we could be sold. Those are some examples of bad changes that came from many people adopting the same behavior at the same time, but there are good things too. For example, there's the writers and now actors strike. This could be a huge change for the entertainment industry, and this happened with a lot of people working together to make that decision. Or how about the rise of all those secondhand platforms that make it easier to shop secondhand? That happened because more and more people are interested in shopping and selling secondhand. More people are seeing that the value of clothing extends much longer. And this has created a social trend that also benefits the planet, right? That people are like, huh, secondhand clothes, pretty cool, right? What else? Uh, Buy nothing groups, more and more creative reuse centers, even the way that the use of harmful ableist language is becoming more and more socially unacceptable. That's because people said something about it, others heard it, they told others, and it spread and spread. I could go on all day. Basically, there are so many good things that have happened in the past few years or even 10 years that happened because we all made the decision to do it. And I know sometimes, especially going back to 2020 and 2021, when people would be like, I have no impact on this world, my throwing my hands in the air, I'm giving up. I can see why people felt that way then because it did feel, if you were like the person who you know, didn't go to large gatherings and, you know, always wore a mask and washed your hands a lot and really worried about spreading COVID, you felt defeated because there were just as many people out there who believed otherwise. And it kind of felt like, what can I even do, right? I am so powerless. But I want to assure you that was a unique situation in itself. And we've actually made so much other progress over the past few years. The point is change happens when we all do it together. When we welcome more people to our community, we form a whole ass movement, which to be honest, I think we are experiencing right now. Yes, slow fashion and anti-consumerism is a movement. And I do see the changes happening, which brings me to the final thing I've learned over the past three years. It's progress, not perfection. And of course, the patience this is the hard part, that is required for slow progress. I've seen a lot of progress over the past few years. There are indicators of a larger social change all around us. There's the success of the pay up movement. There's a large shift into shopping secondhand. There are bigger conversations about why we shop and how we change that. Mainstream media outlets are running segments about the impact of fast fashion I swear I saw a clip from the Today Show, okay? The Today Show is not typically part of the slow fashion community. And what they're doing are bringing these ideas to more and more people who don't live within that. That's that's how this all becomes bigger. Even the way we talk about sustainable fashion over the past few years has changed. It's more intersectional. It's less shopping focused. It's all about buying less in the first place. We've shifted the conversation away from shopping and I'm excited to see that continue to grow as well. It's fun to look back and be like, oh my God, this is happening. But it happened kind of slowly, right? Like we didn't see it day by day, but three years later, we can see a lot of evidence that this movement is making progress. And it's progress driven by individuals, by you, by me, and 
everyone else in our community. It wouldn't be happening if we hadn't started working on this in the first place. If we had just put our arms up in defeat and said, eh, I can't really do much as a singular person. Imagine if three years ago when I had started to think about creating Clothes Horse, if I just said, never mind, I'll go play The Sims instead. Not that I'm trying to like toot my own horn over here, but people do say to me, hey, thank you for starting these conversations because you've taught me so much and now I'm making changes in my life and teaching these things to other people. I am just one person. I am just one grain of sand in this large desert that we all live in. And yet even I, as one person, have had an impact. And so have you. So have all of us. As for me, I plan on continuing to work on Clothes Horse as long as possible. In the beginning, I wondered, how long can we talk about this stuff? But over time, the conversations have changed and evolved. More voices have been featured on my platform. And it turns out there's so much more stuff to discuss. I also want to take a moment to thank all of the incredible guests who have shared their time and expertise over the last few years. Some are longtime friends, others are new friends. I am grateful for Close Horse for giving me this chance to get to know all of them, to have these conversations, and to lead me to meeting all of you. In fact, the people aspect of Close Horse is my favorite thing about it all. As a mildly extroverted, sometimes but mostly introverted person, I have met so many smart, funny, talented, interesting people over the last few years that I would have never met otherwise. I am so grateful for this community. You have kept me going during some really, really hard times, and you have reminded me of my value when other aspects of my life have stripped away my self-esteem. So thank you. I'm still trying to figure out how to make Clothes Horse financially sustainable. For the past few years, the salary from my job has subsidized this work. Now that I have left that job, the support of the community is more important than ever. So please consider supporting via Patreon or other sources. You can find all those links in my Instagram bio. You can advertise your business on Clothes Horse. You can also hire me to speak at events or even utilize my expertise as a consultant for your business, which you can learn more about at clotheshorseconsulting.com. But my goal is to continue to grow Clothes Horse, to reach more people, to hopefully get to meet more of you IRL in the next year and do other workshops and events. I'm constantly thinking of ideas. I would love to hear your ideas as well. You can use that as a reason to call the Clothes Horse hotline. (laughs) I don't know. I'm excited. I'm excited about what is going to come next. So here's to three more years. And thank you so much to Aaron for calling in. It was so nice to hear your voice. Have you ever stood in front of a closet brimming with clothes yet felt you had absolutely nothing to wear? And at the same time, you don't want to buy more and more new stuff? No way. Well then... I'm excited to tell you about the Lucky Sweater app. This is not your typical fashion app, but a community-driven trading platform designed to revitalize how you engage with your wardrobe. I even did an episode with their co-founder and CEO, Carly, and I am an avid fan, just a major fan, of what Lucky Sweater is doing. Lucky Sweater disrupts the traditional cycle of buy, wear, discard by fostering communities where cherished fashion pieces and craft supplies can be traded. Yes, that's right. This is an app for swapping, not shopping, allowing you to refresh your wardrobe, discover new brands, and develop your true personal style with a trusted community and without the burdensome baggage of overconsumption. We're all over that now, right? There are two vibrant communities within the Lucky Sweater app. The slow fashion community trades a treasure trove of sustainable brand pieces from Nettle Studios, Elizabeth Suzanne, Ilana Cohn, and so much more. Then there is the me-made community where knitters, sewists, and DIY enthusiasts trade handmade pieces and surplus supplies. And the exciting news is... Lucky Sweater is set to expand to more communities, such as those focused on thrifted items, vintage fashion, and even children's clothing. I 
can't wait. But the trading is not all that's great about Lucky Sweater. Folks share advice and outfit and project inspiration in the community sections of the app. I mean, it's just, it's all about community. Someone needs to come up with a better name for an app that conveys the connections within it. If you're ready to make a sustainable and fun shift in your wardrobe, go ahead and download Lucky Sweater today from the App Store or Google Play Store and use the invite code CLOSEHORSE to join in. That's invite code CLOSEHORSE. Happy trading! All right, after that long introduction, let's jump into my conversation with Joanne. So I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Joanne Brash, and I'm with the California Product Stewardship Council. My pronouns are she, her. And what is the California Product Stewardship Council? We're a nonprofit. We're based out of Sacramento, California, and we do two things. We do education and we do advocacy. Um, So how I fill my day um, is through a lot of grant projects, pilot projects, but most importantly is the legislation that we work on through our advocacy work. And how did you get into this? Because obviously, you know, I did some Googling, I read your bio, and I thought it was, you've done some really incredible work with the UC Davis health system that I found fascinating because when people talk about textile waste, they usually just think of clothing, which obviously is a big part of it. But you were working on another aspect of textile waste there. Yeah, thank you for so much for noticing. Um, That's one of my (laughs) most proudest career attributes is how long I have successfully avoided fashion. Yay! Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, up until a few years ago, once I really joined CPSC about five years ago, most of my work was in protective clothing, functional clothing, and my research was in hospital waste and, Mm. and how technical fabrics and functional fabrics can reduce waste in a hospital and healthcare setting. But ultimately, um, I mean, I had a really large budget at the UC Davis Health System to (laughs) kind of adopt these reusable surgical items. But the biggest barrier was policy. So Mm. most people don't realize that like I crossed over into policy work through uh, hospital trash. So I'm really well versed (laughs) in like biohazardous uh, waste requirements and you know, the really, really gross stuff that no one wants to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) And when you were growing up, did you imagine a future for yourself where you would be really wrapped up in bio waste? (laughs) (laughs) Well, no one really chooses the trash life. The trash life chooses you. (laughs) So Um, true. (laughs) But we call it the wonderful world of waste because when you talk about like the colleagues we work it with and some of the conferences that are happening in this space around the country and around the world. Um, I mean, everyone's really passionate in this space because as long as you work in trash, (laughs) you (laughs) see the ugliest side of commodities and commodification. I bet. Primarily today, we're going to be talking about your work on textile stewardship, but I thought we could get started by talking about EPR. Uh, Because, as I was telling you before we started recording, many listeners of Close Horse are very excited to learn more about EPR. So, you know, to get started, what is it? So EPR is Extended Producer Responsibility, and it's a very specific policy. Mm -hmm. And it's a model that is based off of the philosophy that if you have the producer of the products taking responsibility to the final disposition of the product's life cycle, then that responsibility and that kind of ultimate business efficiency is going to internalize these impacts that have currently been externalized in these linear systems. And so waste is really just one of those externalized impacts. We also talk about toxics, we talk about microfibers, we talk about, you know, exposures and, and, you know, issues during the labor issues in the production process. Mm -hmm. So uh, although my life is spent (laughs) very deep in the waste world, 
EPR really kind of extends that responsibility to uh, the producers of those individual products. So we have EPR in California and several states throughout the United States for different product types. So mm -hmm. there's nothing in the United States for textiles and clothing, but we in California have 14 different varieties of EPR. And I say varieties because there are variations of this policy tool, um, maybe ones that add a consumer facing fee. Like that's not true EPR mm -hmm. if there's a public fee. That's a publicly funded pro program. Mm -hmm. And you lose a lot of the um, philosophical momentum of producer Definitely. funding. <laughs> if they're paying for it, it's more reason for them to make it easier to collect, easier to mm -hmm. disassemble, easier to identify because they have to pay for that as the as incorporated into the product's true cost. And that's a big sea change because right now ultimately it, it, with the exception of some categories in some states, most things you buy when you are done with it, it is your job as the consumer to figure out what happens next, which could include paying to have it hauled away ditching it somewhere and making it someone else's problem, donating it and possibly making it the thrift store's problem. So saying that the, the producers would be responsible financially for the end of life is a huge shift. Mm -hmm. How would this be different for consumers beyond, you know, maybe we don't have to call 1-800-JUNK or something? <laughs> How would this change the products we buy and what we do with them when we're done with them? So despite how like big these EPR programs end up being, like big budgets, big uh, like outreach campaigns, a lot of the public doesn't see a too much of it. Um, mm -hmm. Typically, when we pass an EPR program or a legislation, the public doesn't hear about it for maybe another four years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's a long process to get the regulations written, uh, to get the plan written and approved, and then to get that plan up and running. Um, but typically, by the time it hits the consumer-facing uh, disposal needs, mm -hmm. you're going to see really clear directions on where to take your textiles or whatever covered product it is once it meet like once you no longer want it like mm -hmm. and so many people just like there's literally nowhere to take our textiles that are unusable mm -hmm. you know like uh, at scale and the key thing about EPR for the public is that it's free and it's convenient because if it's not free and convenient to the public that's when you start dealing with illegal dumping or you mm -hmm. start dealing with um you know issues with contracts and your haulers and you talked about you know the current system of funding our our waste and so that happens with our local government you know every time they add a new program <clears throat> The cost of that program gets split amongst the residents of that city or county, and that gets paid by your garbage rates. So garbage mm. is actually not funded through general tax. It's actually a rate payer, so it's a fee. And mm -hmm. one thing everyone who works in policy needs to know is the difference between a tax and a fee. So garbage is a fee because you get a service in exchange for that fee. So mm -hmm. when we talk about EPR and we talk about programs, we're talking about let's add more programs that are accessible to the residents without increasing our garbage bill. So that's my job. Let's get more recycling without higher bills. <laughs> I mean, you bring up a really good point that most people right now, I mean, the question I receive most often on social media is, what do I do with these textiles that are unusable? There's no life back in them. Like, this is it, right? Uh, and I never have a good answer because there isn't one. So it's exciting to think that that could be a solution for everyone. At my last house, before we moved here to Austin, we had to pay a private company to take our trash. And I always say that that was when I became most aware of our trash and how much we created and how we could minimize that and find other places for things because we were charged by the amount of trash we put out. You know, whereas in other places I'd lived, it was baked into some other thing I was paying somewhere and I didn't really have that awareness and it was just 
throw out as much trash as you want, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Fill the bin. (laughs) Fill the bin and then some, what have you. And I do think like on one hand, it's great for us as consumers to have this concept of our waste, um, for it to be more clear that this is actually a service that is a very expensive service to fulfill, but also to have more options for what we do with things other than like maybe the recycling bin, maybe the trash can, Mm -hmm. Maybe like here in Austin, we have a compost bin as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I get really excited when, when I talk about EPR. But one thing that I hear often is this concern that it will drive up prices of products for consumers. What are your thoughts on that? Well, consumers are already paying for it. And if we want a textile (laughs) recycling program, your garbage rates are going to go up otherwise. So I say either way, if we want to create a program that has all the right steps in terms Mm -hmm. of reporting and transparency, um, there are some costs. But at the end of the day, it's who's paying it and what Mm -hmm. responsibility do they have by paying that. If it ends up being a consumer fee, which here in California, we pay recycling fees on a lot of items. So, you know, it it's, yeah, another product. But we've seen these studies happen on other products. Like for the medicine EPR program, there was a mm-hmm. study done by UCLA and they found, you know, for every $100 of prescriptions, the EPR would bring it up like 13 cents. So, you, you know, there oh. is an inherent cost, but when you're talking about 13 cents on $100 for a super hazardous product, you can imagine it's gonna be a much lower cost for <laughs> textiles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and the, the philosophy is that like, w- if you have a government run recycling program, you're not gonna have the same efficiencies and the same access to knowledge of like, what are these fiber blends? Like the mm-hmm. industry knows that. Right. And, Fashion or textiles, for one, is one of those products that I would much rather see the industry run it than the government run it. And that's what yeah. EPR is. <laughs> I agree. I agree. You know, one thing that I have noticed in my experience as a buyer, but just also in my research, is that right now there's basically this infinite number of combinations of textile blends right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the biggest arguments for EPR is that will force brands, you know, manufacturers to reduce that Mm -hmm. (laughs) and stick to a few that are more easily recycled. So in terms of the environmental impact of EPR, how would this impact waste streams? Like right now, it seems most textiles end up just going to the landfill, right? Like an extraordinary amount every day. Would that change? And where would they go? What would happen to them? Well, you would think they're just going to the landfill, um, but they're not. They're actually Mm -hmm. also ending up in our recycling streams. They're ending Mm -hmm. up in illegally dumped in our environment. And then they're ending (laughs) up in the landfills abroad as well. So um, one of the things that EPR really does is it it takes responsibility for all those different streams of uh, output. And ultimately it creates a source separated recycling program so it doesn't mix in with the other products we've seen cities in california try to put textiles into the blue bin san francisco and san jose are those two prime examples and what happened was uh they blend they absorb with the liquids in your you know in your cans and foodware that get in the same recycling bin. So they absorb, then they tangle in the machines that are made for hard plastics. Every time they have to stop a machine and they're cutting out of the cogwheels, it's usually plastic bags and textiles. And what we found in those two cities was it cost more for them to maintain their machinery and pull the textiles out of the bins than it was worth it. So just last week, CPSC was at the city of San Jose at the green waste facility and they knew we were coming and we were doing a textile sort and a textile audit and I'm not Mm -hmm. exaggerating when I tell you in a day and a half so three shifts uh, at the MRF they pulled 5,800 
pounds of textiles off the recycling line. <laughs> and they're not supposed to be in wow. the recycling bin. <laughs> wow. So that's one city, one day, one line. And that does not include the landfill line. So if you've ever been to a MRF, usually there's like the landfill mixed solid waste. But then there's, you know, the mixed recyclables are usually kind of like the clean side of the MRF. Mm -hmm. And so they were pulling the textiles from the clean side of the MRF even though they weren't clean, <laughs> 5,800 pounds in less than 48 hours. Wow. And are people doing that because they just don't know what to do with them? Or is there confusion about textiles being recyclable? Both. There's confusion because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in the city of San Jose, when they decided, you know, a few years ago that that just really didn't work, uh, it becomes down to education. Like, how do you mm -hmm. stop a program right. once it's begun? Um, so the other problem is... Um, yeah, they think it's just recyclable. They think it's going to be picked out. Um, they think it's plastic. It's polyester. Um, a lot of reasons. And the other thing is we're not really seeing what is going to the landfill from the thrifts. A lot of them mm. self-haul. Yeah. 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 I mean, one thing we talk about quite often here on Close Horse is how really the thrift industry at this point primarily functions in terms of logistics, moving this product around mm -hmm. from, you know, facility to facility. And, you know, it's one of the big drivers of th the increase in thrift store prices because they're left with all the stuff that they have to take somewhere. Um, and we've had some guests who've worked, for example, for the Goodwill, and these things can be moved around to multiple locations before finally being either sold or disposed of. So it's 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 a lot of stuff <laughs> moving around every single day. So much stuff. <laughs> so much stuff. I think I know. And then I spend a day on these like audits or even, you know, at a Goodwill warehouse. And I just get so humbled. Like, oh, my God, it's so much stuff. <laughs> It's so much stuff. Yeah, it's it's really, really wild. It's way more than any of us. I think in our minds, we think it's like what we see in the store. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg in terms of the product moving in and out of these locations every day. So for the actual producers of these items, how would EPR impact them? Would it be a major financial burden or is there a way they can mitigate that? They can absolutely mitigate it by adopting and using materials that are easier to recycle, by working with collection partners that offer convenience to the consumers. So the great thing about EPR programs is it allows a lot of flexibility. And we actually are not limiting how many producer responsibility organizations we will allow in California. For some product types, they say just one or each each uh, organization needs to have at least 20% of the market share. We actually are proposing, like, let's see who shows up to the table to actually lead on some of these programs for textiles and clothing. And so how would EPR be implemented, like in the ideal way? in terms of clothing and textiles. What would that look like? I will say it's, it's really different in California than it is around the world, especially in Europe. There's a lot of proposals going on in Europe right now. And, you know, they're lo looking and talking about how we can really um, kind of copy and, and, and match and standardize as much as we can. But ultimately, in California, we're more likely to follow the precedents and the programs we've set, so the style that's mm -hmm. already been established in California. So here in California, um, there's a couple things that are really standard in our example, 14 other <laughs> programs. And one of the key <laughs> things is that the PRO, which is the Producer Responsibility Organization, is a nonprofit. That's okay. non-negotiable for us. We've seen in the past them try to be, they were trying to be like a 501c6, which is a trade association or mm. a C4. And what we realized yeah. is without that IRS C3 nonprofit, uh, we didn't get the transparency we needed. 
Mm-hmm. Some of the other things that are really key to California style EPR programs is that we do not have uh, design mandates or program prescriptions. So we don't tell them how to collect. We just say there has to be a minimum of this much collection per capita. Or, uh, you know, one of the things we say in the in our bill, SB 707, is, um, which I don't know if we've introduced quite yet, um, one of the things we propose in EPR in California is uh, a lot of the collection hosts who want to be in the part program can't be denied. So we don't force anyone to be a collection host. Um, just because you're a retailer in California, you don't have to have a bin at your store. But if you want mm-hmm. one, you can't get denied. So we have a lot of opt-in, we have a lot of incentives, and not a lot of mandates or prescriptions. Um, so that's really the California style. And the way it really works is the brands group together and they write a plan on how they're going to meet these performance requirements. Um, And every five years, there's a new plan. So we Mm -hmm. have flexibility. If you write it in the law and it's a government run program, if there needs to be a change, you have to change the law. But with a fast moving market, like fashion and textiles and, you know, <laughs> sustainability. You need a program who can ad- that can adapt to the market. So as we incentivize green design, so let's say we incentivize durability or we incentivize less blends, mm-hmm. those producers will automatically be not only paying less in, receiving some of the benefits as well. Oh, okay. The other great example is we don't have a recycled content mandate, 30% Mm by 3030. Like that's not a requirement because uh, it's not practical for every product. So instead, you know, they'll just pay less (laughs) if they have recycled content. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an incentive in itself. You know, one company that comes up a lot that has its own sort of take back program that is problematic is H&M, you know, and I'm sure all of you have talked about (laughs) H&M amongst yourselves, at least where, you know, uh, customers are incentivized to donate their clothing to the to the store's bin, and they get a coupon for a discount. But what's come up time and time again over the past few years is those clothes weren't really being recycled in the way that customers thought. I mean, a lot of them were ending up overseas. Uh, and becoming someone else's problem. So what would happen if, if say, I don't know why this this b- retailer came into my head right away, but it was like Kohl's, right? If Kohl's had started having the drop-offs at their store for post-consumer textiles, what would happen to them when they leave the store? The clothes, not the customers. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so one of the great things about the California style EPR is the tracking and reporting. We get Mm -hmm. uh, precedent level transparency where we, uh, in our annual reports, and I say our, but in Cal Recycles, they receive the annual report every year from these PROs. And in those annual report, they say exactly how much was collected where, where it went, and what products it became. Um, so I will say, um, I know you, you talk about H and M and they talk a lot about H and M and I will actually start by thanking H and M for endorsing SB 707, which is the textile EPR bill in California. And we welcome them to the California style (laughs) EPR. (laughs) um, I've worked really closely with them and I, I, I will say, I think all the suggested amendments that they have made on the bill in California have made it stronger for everyone. Um, and I will say uh, they have been doing it for a long time, but this will be their first time in California. So we welcome them. And that information will be publicly available through California style public agencies. So again, it's not really about having all the details in the te- textile program specifically, but leaning mm-hmm. on the other accomplishments of our government and our agencies that aid in the implementation. 
So a big thank Nikki, you to Cal great. Recycle. They put their necks out there for the carpet program. They've taken them to court mm -hmm. and won for that EPR program. They have uh, out there writing the regs for the EPR program for packaging. If they can get through packaging, they can easily get through textiles. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about packaging because I feel like that's something most people don't think about that it generates an incredible amount of waste at this point <laughs> in the e-commerce era. So that's really, really exciting. I mean, but just like also food packaging. I mean, is something that's sort of invisible in a strange way yeah. to so many people. One of the other really great components of the California style EPR programs um, are kind of our definitions. So we talked about packaging. Mm -hmm. um, those set some really global precedent definitions on how we define recycling. And similarly, mm -hmm. in SB 707, the textile EPR bill in California, um, we set a precedent uh, definition specifically for textile recycling because we see a lot of greenwashing happening. And we feel mm. like that definition alone will eliminate some of the collectors and brokers who are collecting under the guise of recycling but ultimately dumping as reuse. So this bill actually mm. eliminates that and adds the transparency. Um, that's great. At an enforceable level. When we talk about enforcement, that's when I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of get excited about the enforcement too, actually. So, so what are the biggest obstacles to getting EPR passed? I mean, obviously like, I mean, California is a very special state, right? And But we're not seeing this happening across the United States, much less across the globe. What are the biggest obstacles, you know, both in California, but also outside of California, that are preventing this from being just the way it goes everywhere? Well, I also will give a shout out to New York. So they also introduced a textile EPR bill. And with those being the highest concentrations of uh, mm -hmm. textiles, it's great to see the lead. But you never know, Washington and Oregon come out sometimes of less field with their own EPR bills. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the biggest thing is education. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today because they are complicated programs and it means mm -hmm. different things for different program, like brands. Like if you make accessories, you know, out of recycled resin pieces, you know, that's a different meaning than the transnational multi-fiber blend fast fashion. So, for mm -hmm. me, uh, and my interpretation of the biggest challenge is the education and getting ev all the stakeholders to understand what their role is if this program passes. So CPSC, our leadership in EPR isn't that we know everything. Actually, we never know everything and we know that. <laughs> our skills are to get all the stakeholders to the table, to get through the legislative process together, and I'll be like equally unhappy. <laughs> like none of us is going to get <laughs> all we want. I'll even admit I'm not right. going to get everything I want out of the bill. But let's mm -hmm. all design a program that we can be proud to start together, uh, knowing that there's opportunities in the future to improve and tinker with cleanup bills. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important call out. I think it can be really easy to feel sort of demoralized when a bill is passed and not in the purest form that you imagined. But that is the nature of legislation. It's negotiation and compromise. And it has to start somewhere, right? Absolutely. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, 
the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room, all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Gabriela Antonis is a visual artist, an upcycler, and a fashion designer. But Gabriela Antonis is also a feminist micro business with radical ideals. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the world needs. If you find yourself in New Orleans, Louisiana, you may buy her ready to wear upcycle garments in person at the store Slow Down at 2855 Magazine Street. Slowdown Nola only sells vintage and slow fashion from local designers, and Gabriella's garments are guaranteed to be in stock in person, but they also have a website so you may support this woman-owned and run business from wherever you are. If you're interested in Gabriella making a one-of-a-kind garment for you, DM her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram at slowfashiongabriella. That's Gabriella with one L. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play, not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single-stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. <laughs> (laughs) 
Let's talk about the work that CPSC is doing with textile stewardship. Based on all the information you sent me in advance, this work involves many facets of the supply chain, which is the kind of thing I really geek out on. I love seeing all the different stops along the way. I love thinking about all the different elements of a product life cycle. So I would love to talk about how all these different industries and aspects impact textile stewardship and how you're working to make them better. Because I think some people are like, okay, well, it's the place where you bought the clothes and then the customers and like, that's it. But it's actually way more complex, complex than that, right? There are so many stakeholders, so many stops along the line for textiles. So starting with, I mean, this is the obvious one, large brands and retailers, how are you getting them on board with textile stewardship? Yeah, absolutely. So we have for the last three and a half years, we have a textile advisory committee that we've been hosting um, who really have been guiding CPSC with our pilot projects, with our policy work. um, And they were really core to helping CPSC develop the model that was used for SB 707. We have a couple big brands on that one, but we've also worked with some of the big associations. So um, retail retailers associations and I don't want to name too many by name until they endorse the bill (laughs) but we meet non-stop with the association so if they're not trickling down information to their members um, I really Mm -hmm. ask the big brands and retailers like if those associations are uh, doing the work that they need and sharing the information because I've met with all of them lots of times in the last (laughs) six months Um, so I keep hearing from the brands that they don't know much about the bill so I'm curious Curious. What? Yeah, why? <laughs> Who's gatekeeping yeah, there? Sure. <laughs> I know. I but know. But we do. So we, we have an active social media. We have a public listserv. We have publicly funded pilot projects. We do free webinars. Um, we do a lot that is publicly accessible, given our funding mm-hmm. base is usually going to come from the public space. And then what about another aspect of this project is working with commercial textile waste generators, Mm -hmm. which you should probably define (laughs) first. (laughs) Yep. So in the waste world, you have your residential waste generators. Those are coming from your apartments and your single family households. Those wastes Mm -hmm. are usually serviced by uh, a franchise hauler. Like, so one company Mm -hmm. services. On the other side is Mm -hmm. the commercial waste generators, and those are coming from the businesses. Um, And so Mm. commercially generated textile waste are textiles that are coming out of businesses. So yeah, in Los Angeles, we have uh, some pilot projects that are primarily focused on commercially generated textiles because they have so many factories that includes factories and textile scraps. But if you look across the country, commercially generated textiles include what's coming out of hotels, right? Your hospitality Mm -hmm. linens, that includes, um, you know, rags, uniforms. And like, I can't even tell you how many companies, how much money they spend on uniforms. Let's get some recycled content. Let's get some repair. I have this one uniform repair grant I've been soliciting and that keeps getting denied. So if anyone listening has funding, um, I'd love to work with a business and really see how much money is saved uh, that the company saves. If we start repairing uniforms instead of just recycling or landfilling them. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure most of the listeners are had not even considered that uniforms and bedding and all of these other, you know, tablecloths and, and napkins and whatnot from restaurants would be a source of a, a significant amount of textile waste. So it's always important to underscore that. You know, if, a few years ago, I worked on a project with a company based in Portland that was upcycling all of the retired Delta uniforms, like from the flight attendants, the pilots, they were like, they did a whole overhaul. They had, I believe Zach Posen designed their new uniforms. And so just like thousands of pounds of uniforms showed up at their warehouse and they turned it into bags and travel accessories and other items. And what struck me about these uniforms is the incredible quality of all of them and how sad it would have been for them to have no future beyond 
beyond that because they were just like the best wool fabrics I had seen other amazing textiles. And, you know, that's just one airline. Um, I'm not saying that all the air flight attendant uniforms are that nice, but those were really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what about, this was another one that I thought was really interesting, industrial laundry and textile rental. Because, for example, I know this isn't exactly it, but I worked for a clothing rental company a few years ago, and I was shocked, just shocked by the amount of clothing waste that was being generated on a regular basis there. Like in my mind, everything was coming in, being you know cleaned, repaired, and sent back out. And that really wasn't what was happening. And I thought like, wow, I know, you know, I was thinking about like people who rent tuxedos or I don't know, rent linens for their wedding or, you know, all of these other elements of textile that might not be getting the long use that we would expect. Absolutely. And tapping into my work at the hospital, I mean, people don't always realize that, you know, hospitals, hotels, and dorms, you know, like a lot of those are mm -hmm. renting those linens and a lot of those are being washed mm -hmm. at the same laundries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, hospital linens. That's when you get me excited. <laughs> that's a lot of linens. You know? <laughs> so like, in what way are is CPSC working with these more like industrial laundries and textile rentals services to, you know, manage their waste? Well, actually, they were one of the so there is a uh, textile rental associate association in the United States, and they were one of the first groups to reach out and work with us on some of the legislation in California. Awesome. Because when I, uh, when CPSC a, a few years ago made the initial proposal for a textile EPR bill or program, we pitched the mm -hmm. idea to the California Statewide Recycling Commission. And at that time, we thought, you know, until we have a fully cooked model for a full EPR, let's just pitch the idea of just an, you know, uh, hospitality program. So that one, that scope was really focused on those hospitality linens, the commercially generated uh, linens, the rentals. Um, so the industry groups have already been alerted and aware of that proposal and we're really on board because one of the benefits that those laundries get are support with their repair costs. They get support with the mm -hmm. recycling. They get support with mm -hmm. the microfiber filtration. So there's a lot of nexus oh, wow. between these stakeholders Whereas they might have certain costs under the program, they usually see more benefits. That's awesome. Okay, well, what about, this is a big one. We've already touched on this a little bit, thrift stores. Yeah, the thrift stores. This is who I really wanted to help <laughs> with, with our proposed bill, because I feel like they get blamed a lot. And they've really been burdened in our society as like the pre-sorters yeah. of, of all things usable, but maybe Ooh. it's not usable. And um, here in California, the thrift stores have been really active with some of the e-waste programs because they've been dumped on with e-waste, you know? Oh my goodness, they have. And <laughs> yes. with CBSC, we actually sponsored and passed battery EPR legislation last year. So any of the listeners who, if you're a producer or a brand who makes a product with batteries, you're already looped into a program. But basically, mm -hmm. you know, we, we started to look at, you know, who, where, where are these waste products accumulating and where is it a burden? And so the thrift stores, mm -hmm. we've been engaged since day one in terms of, you know, they've been on our advisory committee. They've been part of our pilot projects. They've been really welcoming to share information that wasn't previously available because a lot of the thrifts that we've worked with, they know they need help and they know some of the market shifts that are happening right now um, are deeper economic shifts that uh, without some of the support proposed in EPR programs, um, they might get stuck with just more waste. 
And so without, we don't want them to be stuck with waste. We want them to be offering right. services. We want them to be offering high quality reuse and secondhand sales and not be burdened with picking <laughs> out, you know, the trash. Yeah. You know, my daughter worked for about six months as a sorter for a thrift store in Pennsylvania. And I was shocked by what I heard about what was showing up there every day because it really was just like everything. Um, you know, like it was basically like the thrift stores were are sorting trash in so many ways right now. Um, and it is like a, it's a huge burden in a lot of different ways. Okay. What about textile recyclers? Cause this is one that, uh, can be a little confusing. Um, if you don't know what they do, you, th- you think that they like pick up all the fabrics. They mash them up and it turns into new stuff, right? But it's it's a lot more complicated <laughs> than that. <laughs> so how do the textile recycling companies play a part in this? So a lot of the textile recyclers can also recycle carpet and some of the textiles that are coming out of mattresses. So we already have mm. programs in California and some of the other states do as well for those programs. So they saw financial support to collect materials that have no value to become feedstock for their technologies or the recycling program. So one of my favorite examples is the Econeal uh, recycled nylon, you know, made of industrial recycled content. But what everyone needs to know is it's carpet and it's carpet from California because we have our EPR program, <laughs> because we gave value to this unwanted carpet, which right. is a great source of nylon. Um, so mm-hmm. that's just one example. So for our pilot projects in California, we tapped into all of the recyclers who are already participating in programs. And we said, hey, if we pre-sort the textiles to your exact specifications, that, that exact 85% nylon or higher, if we pre-sort, can you take textiles? So we did test runs out of city of LA with quite a few of those recyclers. And after that pilot was really successful, they all just started showing up to us. You know, and they said, hey, we heard you have the ability <laughs> to great. pre-sort. Um, can you send me all, all your, you know, cotton blends or, you know, so really, that's amazing. Yeah, so really our role at CPSE isn't, like, we don't run these programs. We we right. empower the champions. We redirect the mm-hmm. funding so that it actually is sustainable. So when you talk about the recyclers, we have more textile recyclers who've endorsed SB 707 than we do have brands. And what a lot of the brands don't realize is the recyclers who are supplying their eco fibers are endorsing the bill. They should probably mm-hmm. endorse it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're so intrinsically connected. I think probably a lot of consumers would be surprised to hear that, but it really is part of the same cycle. And, you know, they should look out for one another. <laughs> um, okay, what about waste haulers? Like literally the people who are like, okay, we're taking all the trash. How are they a part of textile stewardship? Yeah, so here in California and a lot of the waste haulers around the country, um, once they get into contract with a city or a county, they're the ones not only driving around picking up uh, the materials, a lot of times they're the ones kind of doing some of the education. They're also the ones who are mm-hmm. responsible for diversion sometimes. So if you look at the city of LA, you know, the city of LA is held to statewide diversion goals. They also have kind of local goals. But the city itself doesn't touch the materials. It's all contracted to their haulers. So the haulers are the ones, you know, working with the generators, doing the education. And so we work with the haulers in a couple different ways. Um, In our pilot project, phase two in the city of Los Angeles, we're working with the haulers to map out textile routes so that they can take a special truck. So then again, it doesn't mix with the dirty stuff. You can drive to all the top <laughs> textile generators on a designated day, um, fill the truck, drop mm-hmm. it off at the designated sorting facility. Um, and they're really key because they're the ones who are contracted to touch the material. 
And in certain jurisdictions, they can drop it off only at certain locations. So they can't just like drop it off anywhere. Um, and what we're finding is a lot of these cities and waste haulers, they love the turnkey partnerships. Like they want to partner with a thrift. They want to partner with, you know, some sort of charity or something. It, it, it makes it easier to work with the people who know textiles. It's a lot easier. So the waste haulers have really gotten on board with the legislation. Um, one, anything that impacts their contracts, they're interested in. But two, uh, they're just, their hands are tied with textiles. They, they can't mix with their current machinery and their current trucking systems. So this, they, this is their plea for help. Like industry, get to the table. We can't mix it. We can't <laughs> put the textiles in our garbage trucks. <laughs> Right, because basically, like, if the textiles are in the garbage truck, aren't they kind of not usable after Absolutely. that? Or they become maybe a little bit of a, right? The, okay, <laughs> like, it sounds gross, but I was The jurisdictions <laughs> who are doing pickups are usually, I'm not even exaggerating, renting box trucks from, like, a U-Haul because they're cleaner. <laughs> <gasps> oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure those fill up really, really it's fast. It's cheaper to rent a truck than it is to clean one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine cleaning a truck, a garbage truck. I, I'm not signing up for it. You need it's it's a lot. <laughs> okay, so what I loved is that you also said that sustainable designers, menders, and tailors are part of all of this too. Mm -hmm. How do they play into it? One of my favorite precedents in SB 707 that we're proposing that's different than the other bills around the world is this major repair component. Here in California, mm. um, we wouldn't be as successful with, with our waste bill if we didn't have the protections we have for our garment workers. So here in California, we have a garment mm -hmm. workers license program. And a few years ago, there was a bill, SB 62, that passed that protects the garment workers to ensure that they're getting uh, fair wages and access to lost wages. Um, so that's one of the great, again, another example of another agency that helps lift up a successful program. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. in our pro, in our pilot with the San Francisco, we use licensed garment workers for our upcycling and our repair. Um, and ultimately, a successful permanent program will spend more money on repair and upcycling than they will for recycling um, because that's what costs the most. Um, but that's what we know is ultimately uh, the greatest impact on GHG, greatest impact on waste reduction, greatest job generator, mm -hmm. like hands down the most important part of the program and the one I'm most proud of and nobody has opposed that component. <laughs> I mean, I love that. That's my favorite part. All of it is great, but... And I will say, I will never have a successful waste program without a designer on, on contract because you need the designers to know the fabrics, to know the uses. Otherwise, mm -hmm. from a waste perspective, it's just a material. And so, like, a lot of the work you're doing, it really involves state policy, right? So how does local government play into this? So CPSC's primary funding source is local government. So it's cities and counties Great. who are just fed up. And we work on hard-to-manage products. <laughs> so our funders tell us, hey, this product is mm -hmm. costing us too much money. It, it's too much of a hassle. Please so it's not that we only work on state legislation. It's, that's just our main um, component, what we're committed to. We also do local ordinances. So with the city of Los Angeles, there is a five-year goal to pass a local EPR program in the city of Los Angeles. And if you look at the success of the medicine EPR program, the reason CPSC won against Big Pharma is because the local government came to bat and they went <clears throat> to the Supreme Court against pharma industry. And it was because the local government passed ordinances that said, you know, we have the right to protect our local communities. We have the right to pass laws that we feel are public benefit. And what the Supreme Court mm -hmm. found was that EPR is in the benefit of the public 
And so it's actually the local government who led the way uh, nationally, um, specifically Alameda County. So another big props to Alameda County and their city council and their lawyers um, from 2018. Um, without their leadership, we wouldn't have the the precedent we need to take on bigger and more powerful industries and you, you wouldn't believe it but i do think textiles and clothing are more powerful and more um complicated than pharma <laughs> imagine <laughs> so i have like a question about the medicine epr because this is fascinating to me so was it like before consumers would just like throw medicine away, which sounds dangerous, or was there some other larger issue? And how did EPR change that? Yeah. So actually, before we could do the EPR on medicine, we actually had to work with federal, state, and local government to get medicine off the flush list. It was actually... <gasps> oh, you mean like in the toilet? Yeah, that was, <laughs> oh or gosh. they say to put it in the trash. Or there was literally right. it was one of those products that had no safe consume mm -hmm. like safe and convenient <laughs> consumer mm -hmm. program so you know that that partially has a lot to do with the addictions and coupled with the over prescriptions and no disposal systems um, that mm -hmm. was part of the motivation for our local governments at Alameda County San Francisco County San Mateo County we ended up getting 13 counties to take on big pharma and um, now, you know, 2023, so it took a good six years. We're now seeing bins at all the pharmacies in California. So at our Walgreens, at our Rite Aids, and they're free. You just throw your meds in there and they're disposed of safely. And that's because of the EPR program. And another good example of why the public doesn't always see the backside and the big fight that had to go on <laughs> in order for those bins to just magically show up at their local pharmacy. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing because, yes, most people have no idea that it would be so hard to create something that's safe. And most people um, don't realize that Canada has it. Mexico has it, Europe has wow. it. Wow. They didn't have to go through the legislative fight that we did to wow. get it. Wow. So obviously the medicine EPR has been successful. Uh, are there any others that you're just super proud of or that you, know, you think are going to be big game changers? Um, well, I, I am really proud of the battery EPR bill um, that we passed that's in the regulatory phase. Um, but if you look at the ones that are already implemented, I am proud of the mattress bill. Even though it's not true EPR, it's a consumer fee. So we consider that mm -hmm. like product stewardship. Um, they had a lot of textiles going to the landfill because it's the outer shell, it's some of the mm -hmm. filling. Um, and what we saw year after year is they continued to invest in research um, they and continue to invest in market development for textiles. And so ultimately, when we decided to do legislation on, on textile EPR, it was to support the established programs which are consumer funded because why should the California public pay to solve textile recycling's biggest problems. So um, yeah, yeah I, I would say the mattress program and in terms of textiles has been really impressive. If you go to the Mattress Recycling Council's website and you look up some mm -hmm. of their textiles research, you can see some of the great uses they've done with their uh, EPR money. I mean, I love that because when I was living in LA, there were abandoned mattresses everywhere because people just don't know what to do with them constantly abandoned mattresses on my street that hung out there until I'm sure I guess the city came and took them away. But mattresses are really big, you know, so this is a big, a big win. Um, what, are, what are the greatest obstacles that you faced, especially when it comes to, you know, getting more policy around EPR and more people involved for textiles? Um, I mean, the biggest challenge I have found is getting stakeholders and policymakers to understand some of the nuances of the mm -hmm. programs. 
and, and how the textile program really differs from some of the other programs. Um, but that really ties back to what we talked about earlier in education. So mm -hmm. CPSC has been leading on education at the Capitol for over a decade. Um, we take legislators on trips around the country to see how EPR works in other states and how it works in Canada. Uh, we do a lot of tours that, to see textile sorting, textile um, fiber identification devices. So it's not just about, you know, it's about educating through multiple channels and mm -hmm. the people making the decisions need to meet the people who are impacted by those decisions. Agreed. Agreed. So, you know, every time I talk about EPR, even in the slightest way on Instagram or here on the podcast, so many people reach out, like, how can I get involved? How can I be part of a push for EPR. What do you suggest to listeners? How can they be more involved? We, anyone can get involved in the California bill. Uh, we have a coalition letter that is open to individuals. It's open to organizations. Um, but the most powerful advocacy that individuals can do is within their own organizations um, and within their own networks to share an understanding of how these complicated waste programs are actually really simple. <laughs> really, and really, you know, like, hey, you know, it, it's not just about this fee that the brands are going to have to pay. This is mm -hmm. about getting a vehicle of funding f from the problem to the solution. So, mm -hmm. Signing on to California's bill, getting people and brands you work with to sign on to the California bill. Um, we have some of the most amazing brands and, and retailers who've signed on and different stakeholders. But I know that's not just California. So, you know, I'm sure we can share how they can get a hold of CPSC and get onto that letter and get into that mm -hmm. legislative uh, role here in California. But in other states, if they're in New York, to contact Kavanaugh's office. Um, that, that legislator in New York is the author of the New York EPR bill. You know, he, they need to hear that it's an important issue. Um, another way that they can really get involved, especially if your listeners are in states that don't have bills that are already introduced, is to actually start to see which associations are getting mobilized in your local community? Is there a local fiber shed chapter? Is there, you know, a council of goodwills or any type of thrift store associations? Um, I'm also a, the board chair of the uh, Textile Chemists Association in the California chapter. Ooh. And I think getting involved in boards and getting involved in different places that these conversations are happening are really easy. Mm -hmm. And and speaking up, um, you know, I can only be so many places so many times. And so <laughs> I love going on to recorded places like this podcast because people can listen at their own leisure and they can learn mm -hmm. when it's convenient for them. And so when it's convenient for your listeners to educate and to teach, I hope they take that opportunity to do so. Agreed. Agreed. So do you have... To wrap things up here, do you have any advice for ways that individuals can practice their own textile stewardship? Yeah, I think first and foremost, just repairing and, and using what you have. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Doing clothing swaps at your house are, you know, it's really simple and really easy. Um, but I think kind of aligned with my work and my, my work's mission, I think getting involved in your local communities like weight, zero waste groups, getting involved in, um, you know, your, your local mending workshops and actually showing up. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many times we have seen resources go into planning these events and people don't actually show up. It's a good idea, you know, but actually showing <laughs> up. Yeah. Um, and again, <laughs> not just learning, that. but sharing what you've learned as well. Right, right. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's that's how this starts. Because for all of us who are geeking out about EPR, we're kind of like a minority at this point, <laughs> because most people have never even heard those three letters used in a row like that. 
you know? <laughs> so it's like all starts with that. Like, what is it? Um, well, thank you so much, Joanne. I had such a nice time. What a great way to end my week. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at wear underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things 
and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Thank you again to Joanne for taking the time to talk to us. I learned so much. I'm going to share all kinds of resources and info related to her work in the show notes, so please check it out. There are a lot of ways in which you can get involved. Ordinarily, I like to end this all with a pep talk to get you all fired up, but I kind of already did that in the beginning of the episode. At least I hope I did. And it's 104 degrees again today. So I know Dustin really wants me to stop recording so we can turn on the AC. It's been about 45 minutes now and I am, I think my eyes are sweating. So I'll just end it all with this. Thank you for being a part of this with me. Some of you have been listening for the entire past three years. Others came in just recently. And no matter when you started listening, I am so grateful for your time and for my chance to have this platform. Clothes Horse has changed me in a good way. It gave me purpose when I felt I had none. It gave me the reason to wake up and do another day when I wasn't sure I had it in me. And most importantly, it opened up my life to include all of you. And these are not gift horses, pun intended, that I look in the mouth. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. If you like what you heard, Maybe leave a rating, maybe even a review on Apple Podcasts, but most importantly, tell your friends. If you'd like to support my work financially, you can learn more at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. Um, and of course, as always, thank you to my other half, Dustin Travis White, for our music, for our audio support and fixing all the times over the years that I totally messed up the input or was running Photoshop at the same time I was recording and sounded like a computer. So thank you, Dustin. Bye, everyone. See you next week. 